Rocks and stars and dinosaurs, the wonders of the world in biblical perspective. Lecture number two, sun, moon, and stars. Children love books of planets and stars and space, and adults enjoy them too. It's not difficult to find in any bookstore, new or used, uh, large coffee table books with beautiful pictures of the heavens uh, as we see them through the telescopes. And although in the ancient world this the beauties of outer space were not available to their eyes, at least as far as we know, yet an appreciation of the glory of the heavens uh, as a sign of the glory of God and responsibilities of men was certainly known and is found in the scripture. And so if we want to look at the world through Bible eyes, it behooves us to see the objects that God has placed in the heavens uh, not simply in terms of their uh, physical and atomic dimensions, but also in terms of their symbolic meaning in history and in the design of the creation. So let's plunge right in with the creation of the sun, moon, and stars by looking at Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 to 19. Then God said, Let there be lights, or luminaries, in the firmament of the heavens, that is, in the blue sky, to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for appointed times, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was established. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night, the stars he made also. And God placed them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Now as we look at this, we see that the sun, moon, and stars were created to perform several functions in the economy of creation. And to understand what the Bible says about these things later on, we need to look carefully at what's written here. The first thing... Uh, that said about them is that they are lights. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. Now we've looked at the brightness and the shining glory of God as he makes his appearance in the world and these light bearers uh, are glorious just for that reason. They're spoken of as glorious, they're said to be glorious and to have glory and it's in terms of their reflection of God's glory that they have this glory. And so we'll see the light, the shining function of these heavenly bodies in terms of the glory of God as we proceed. And then we see that they are said to be for appointed times or seasons. The idea here is not actually summer and winter and fall and spring, but actually appointed festival times in the religious calendar of the Old Testament. And even though we don't have a religious calendar appointed by the Bible today, the sun and the moon and their cycles still determine the dates for Easter and Christmas. Or Christmas is placed at the winter solstice. And of course Easter is calculated in terms of Passover, which is calculated in terms of the moon. Well, beyond that, we also see that they were given uh, for signs. They were not only lights and glorious, they were also and for seasons, they were also for signs or symbols. The sun and the moon and the stars symbolize certain things. And what they are used to symbolize in Scripture will be made clear to us in these verses themselves. Um, they symbolize governors and rulers, as we'll see. Well, they were made for days and for years, we're told in verse 14. And then it's reiterated that they were to be lights, glories in the firmament of heaven. Remember that the word firmament is called heaven. Uh, verses 6 to 8. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. In verse 8, God called the firmament heaven. So if heaven is what the glory cloud shows us, then lights positioned in the firmament or in the firmament heaven are certainly there to show us the glories 
of heaven. And so since heaven rules the earth, uh, the sun, moon, the stars are proper symbols for earth rulers and governors. And so we read in verse 17 that God placed them in the firmament of the heavens, the firmament of heaven, to give light on the earth, that is to, to uh, show forth the glory, the light, and to govern the day and the night, to rule over it for the dominion of the, gov of the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. That's their governing function to make distinctions. And so, we see that they are given to govern time and thus appropriately symbolize in their symbolic function, symbolize governors. Now they are also an image of the heavenly host. Also an image of the heavenly host because there are a great number of the stars and we'll see in the scripture that they are connected with the host of heaven. Uh, and we'll have to look and see what that is. And so in terms of their symbolism, um, that's what we'll be looking at a great deal in this lecture. We'll be looking at how they represent the heavenly host, or the host of people that God has arrayed around himself. And we'll also be looking at how they symbolize governors and rulers of the earth. Finally, one more point. They are set up to be for days and years, we read in verse 14, and we should call attention to that and think of them as clocks, as clocks. We have clocks on our walls and watches on our wrists, and uh, we also have a clock in the heavens. Long before these things were invented, people told time by the position of the sun, and they told the seasons by observing the stars and the moon as well as the position of the sun in terms of its solstices and equinoxes. And so they were, they were given as clocks. Now, as we study these things in the Bible, the uh, sun, moon, and stars, heavenly phenomena, uh, it's not always possible to separate. It's not only po po not, not possible, but it's not desirable to try to distinguish or separate between one passage and another and say in this passage the, uh, the sun, moon, and stars are spoken of in terms of the heavenly host and in this passage they're talked about in terms of their clock function. Uh, frequently these things are rolled together and so in terms of there being glorious lights, uh, governing seasons, uh, being symbols, uh, representing rulers, being rulers, uh, representing the heavenly host, and being clocks these things are often rolled together in their function in the world. They remain, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and their functions uh, will vary according to what they are said to be doing. Now let's turn from a discussion of the actual creation of the heavenly bodies to a discussion of their glory. The Bible tells us they're glorious. Uh, we don't need to doubt it. If it's not immediately obvious, we can see it in the Song of Solomon book that's right before Isaiah. In Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 10, we read, Who is this that grows like the dawn, as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun? So here we see that the moon and the sun are considered pure and beautiful. And of course, they're compared to the person uh, that's being described. But it's the beauty of the sun and the moon that are spoken of. And in terms of their glory, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a more familiar passage perhaps, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So, when we look into the heavens, we should perceive the glory of God reflected there in an image. And that's why there are coffee table books published by the National Geographic Society and the Smithsonian Institute and innumerable private publishers uh, that have beautiful pictures in them of the heavenly bodies. And that's why they're coloring books of planets, stars, and space. And that's why we are entranced with the beauty of what we see in space. And it's, it's a fortunate thing for us that we live in an age in which, thanks to the development of astronomical lenses, we can see into outer space and actually see these beauties close at hand, which former generations couldn't see. 
so the second point is that these things are glorious and they show the glory of God now let's spend a few minutes talking about the sun the sun is sometimes a symbol of the Lord as he comes in his glory this is particularly said in the book of Malachi comes right before Matthew Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 but for you who fear my name the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall all right so the day of the Lord is coming and on that day says Malachi the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and of course that's talking about Jesus Christ who is the sun of righteousness similarly the image is found in Psalm 84 verse 11 the Lord God is a sun and shield the Lord gives grace and glory so God is like the sun and he shines forth his glory to other things and by reflection they too become glorious so as the sun shines on burnished bronze and makes the bronze glorious so the sun is even more glorious we're told and that's important to us because we'll see that God imparts his glory to his creation and makes it glorious that's what we're working with here so the Lord is compared to the sun and then we ought not to neglect Psalm 19 the heavens are telling of the glory of God and the firmament that is the blue sky firmament heaven is declaring the work of his hands day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge there is no speech and there are no words their voice is not heard their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world in them he has placed a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber it rejoices as a strong man to run his course its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them and there is nothing hid from its heat well the actual person referred to here is probably Samson the word Samson means son and Samson is the bridegroom who is involved with three different women in the course of his life and he is certainly the strong man and in the early days of his ministry at least he ran his course to glorify the Lord but of course he was a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah and if there's anything that pictures Christ as our heavenly bridegroom it's the son the strong man who runs his course and so sometimes in the Bible the son is a symbol for the Lord and we ought not to be afraid of that uh, it figures in Christian art from time to time and we ought to be aware of it if we want to see the world through Bible eyes now how about the stars we come to Roman numeral 4 the stars stars are very often used as symbols of angels or rulers they are a heavenly host and so just as we have the highest heavens that God made in Genesis 1 verse 1 and then we have the firmament heavens that uh, were made later on on day 2 so we have the angelic host and the host of the saints in heaven the highest heavens and we have the stars that are positioned in the lower heavens in the firmament heaven and one represents the other the Bible talks about angels as stars in the book of Job rather familiar passage in Job chapter 38 verse 7 stars and angels where were you says the Lord when I laid the foundation of the earth in verse 7 when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy well the angels were there but men weren't and the angels here are called the stars of the morning and there's a particular reference to angels as stars in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 13 uh, excuse me verse 12 and 13 speaking of Lucifer how you have fallen from heaven O star of the morning shining one son of the dawn verse 13 you said in your heart I will ascend to heaven I will raise my throne above the stars of God I will sit on the mount of assembly so here is probably not literal, literal stars that are referred to but 
the uh, angels themselves, the heavenly host. And there's almost certainly a reference to this heavenly host also in Judges chapter 5, verse 21, in the song of Deborah. She says, The stars fought from heaven. From their courses they fought against Sisera, Sisera being the enemy. And uh, she is speaking here almost certainly of the angels who are associated with the stars. Uh, actual physical stars don't do any fighting. But the angelic host uh, stood with the Lord and caused a great thunderstorm that defeated the enemy on that occasion. The stars fought from heaven. But it's not only angels that are spoken of as stars. Important, prominent people are as well. And that's because the sun, moon, and stars symbolize governors and rulers. Since they are governors and rulers, they symbolize them. One very well-known passage that shows the stars representing men, important rulers, is in Genesis chapter 37, verse 9. Joseph had another dream and related it to his brothers. Lo, I've had another dream, and behold, the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. All right? Now, as we'll see, and we'll come back to this, the, uh, the stars there are the brothers. And they'll be important people because they are a part of the kingdom of God, but here they're spoken of as stars. Apostate Christians, particularly important leaders, are spoken of as stars in Jude. Jude, verse 13 says that the false prophets are like wild waves of the sea casting up their shame like foam wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness has been reserved forever wandering stars they're stars and they have a certain glory but they're wandering and they will eventually be destroyed the book of Revelation speaks of the rulers of the churches as stars in uh, chapter 1, it says that the Lord appears here in Revelation chapter 1, and when John sees him, he sees him holding seven stars. Verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And then look at what happens in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, and he laid his right hand on me and raised him up. The same hand that held up the seven stars reaches down and holds up John, and that identifies John with the stars. He is, he is one of God's stars that's held up by God. And then the stars are identified as the angels of the seven churches in verse 20 and these can't be angels in heaven because they are angels who receive letters so uh, they're obviously the pastors or bishops of the city churches however you divide it up whether they're pastors of a local house church or el bishops of a citywide church or whatever terminology you use they are uh, human beings who have been anointed set apart to be the leaders in the churches and they're called angels and they're called stars stars part of God's heavenly host and why is it that human beings can be called stars and angels well it's because we have been raised with Christ into the heavenlies we find that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 when we were dead in trespasses, we were made alive together with Christ and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, we Christians are positioned in heaven with Christ, and at that, when we are in heaven, we are part of the heavenly host, and we can be compared to angels, and we can be symbolized by the stars. So when you step outside and look at the stars, and you remember the promise made to Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars, that's you, that's me, we're those stars. They represent us. They represent God's people in the church. They represent angels. They represent rulers. And they represent the church. Now, let's look at this symbolism 
in the Bible and take a number of passages that uh, we might want to get before our minds and see how the Bible speaks about these things. I've alluded to some of these, but we'll just briefly look at them. You can go back and study them in more detail if you wish or get other helps, but today we want to just focus our attention on the, the glory that is manifest here in these heavenly bodies and hopefully come away from this lecture with a new view of God's world and its beauties. Um, stars and sun and moon, by the way, are not, should not be strange to us as symbols. Our flag, the United States of America, has got 50 stars on it. Uh, the flag of, and symbols of the Oriental cultures frequently have suns on them, rising suns. Um, and then, of course, the cultures of the Near East have got crescent moons on them, moons and stars. Saudi Arabia and other countries. And so uh, use of these things as symbols for nations and national powers should not be strange to us. Well, let's look first of all at Genesis 15 verse 5. Uh, when God made covenant with Abraham, he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, Thus shall your seed be. And there is some debate among evangelical Christians, scholars, uh, between whether we are talking about adding up the stars in terms of a vast number or reading the heavens in some way. Uh, perhaps Abraham had a, a proper believing Christian understanding of the constellations. Maybe he knew the constellations and that they originally uh, meant something that Christians could appreciate. We'll talk about this at the end of the tape. But maybe he was looking down the constellations and they revealed Jesus Christ to him. It's not really possible to settle that debate, but I did want to call attention to the fact that uh, this passage is discussed in those terms. At any rate, the stars were said to symbolize the coming Messiah in their glory and their position in the heavens. And then another passage that we've looked at already, just briefly, we can look at a little bit more detail, Genesis 37, 5 to 10. Uh, well, 9 and 10. We saw Joseph had a dream and related it to his brothers and said, I've had a dream, and behold, the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? And he doesn't say, Well, you mean the world is coming to an end, the sun, the moon, and stars are falling? No, he interprets it. Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down to you on the ground? So the sun here is not the Lord, but Jacob. And the moon is the mother, and the brothers are the stars. Well, so there is a symbolic use of sun, moon, and stars. And if we have this registered in our mind and begin to look at the world this way, then when we step outside and see these things, we're in a better position to appreciate creation. Well, there are the times to give the sun and out. Are there were three days of darkness. As a night play on Egypt, and there were three hours of darkness on Galilee. And apparently, it wasn't just a solar eclipse, it was actually a, an obliteration of all light altogether, so that there was a total pit of darkness, and that was to the outer darkness of hell. And so, the darkening of the sun would mean what? Well, the third one eclipse of the powers. Of a nation. Egypt worshipped the sun, and so they have the sun of judgment against their false God. And when Jesus Christ, who was the Son of Righteousness, suffered on the cross, putting out the sun as a symbol of his struggle, tribulation, and death. Now, the expression sun, moon, and stars is used to describe the nations of the world and their collapse under the judgment of God. Remember, they symbolize the governors. So let's look at several passages to talk that way and become familiar with them. Isaiah chapter 13 concerns Babylon. Isaiah 13 verse 1, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. That's in verse 1 of chapter 13. And then if we pop over to verse 10, he says, the stars from the heaven and their constellations will not shine forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Well, why does he use this language? 
Well, he's saying that the, the rulers and governors of Babylon are going to be destroyed. That the important people, the stars and the constellations, will not have any glory. They won't have any light. The sun, the king, the moon, important people near the king, they won't be able to give any light. They'll be dark. They will collapse. The nation itself, will go down. It's flag, assuming that they had flags back then. It's banners with stars and suns and moon. They'll be burned up, torn down. That's what's being spoken of here. The language is that the nation will be decreated and shaken down. It's not a reference to the end of the world, you see. It's a reference to the end of Babylon. And I think this is part of our problem as 20th century Christians. We've We've studied Astronomy 101, but we've never studied anything comparable to Astrology 101, which if we studied it would be totally perverted anyway. But we're just not used to biblical symbolism. The Bible uses this language symbolically far more than it uses it literally. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 32. Let me turn forward to there. Ezekiel 32. Verse 2, Son of man, take up a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So we're talking about Pharaoh here and the Egyptians. And if we look at verses 7 and 8, When I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud. The moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. So this is a threat to Pharaoh that God will do to him what he did once before. And that's put out the lights. Remember in the plagues, the three days of darkness. And God says that he will extinguish Pharaoh. Cover the heavens and darken the stars with clouds, you see. Thick clouds. I will cover the sun with a cloud. Well, it might be reading too much in the text, but then it might not be. What cloud will cover the sun? It would be the cloud of God's glory the dark thunder cloud of his wrath that would be spoken of here that will obliterate the light of the sun and the moon and the shining lights in the heavens. The moon gets its light from the sun. If the sun is darkened, then the moon can't give any light either. And the land will go into darkness. So it's not a picture of the end of the world as we think of it, but it is a picture of the end of the Egyptian civilization and judgment against Pharaoh and Egypt because of their sins. Now in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 and 10, we read about the army that's going to come in and, and judge Israel for her sins. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming, surely it is near. And then we have a description of this army that are like locusts. And in verse 10 it says, Before then the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. Well, again, a, a marching army, whether of locusts or men, doesn't have the ability as they march through the land to darken the sun and the moon. Uh, it's possible to think of this in terms of pillage and destruction and uh, the flames and smoke of cities going up and making the sky dark. But the language is more likely... Uh, simply symbolic. The sun, moon, and stars of Judah and Israel, the rulers, uh, the important people, are going to be brought down as this army comes in. The earthquakes and the heavens tremble, and the heavenly bodies are darkened and lose their brightness. And now what do these things mean? Well, they're lights, and their lights are dim, so their glory is lost. They represent rulers, and the rulers are cast down. And they also represent clocks. Remember, the sun, moon, and stars are clocks. And that means the time has run out. When the sun is darkened, and the moon is darkened, and the stars are darkened, then the time has run out for this particular culture. Time has run out for Babylon. Time has run out for Pharaoh. Time has run out for Israel and Judah, for Zion. When this army comes that God brings, the clock stops. The clocks are stopped. If we look on in Joel, we come to a very familiar passage in verses 28 to 32. And perhaps now that we get here, we'll 
be in a better position to understand this. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth. Blood, fire, and columns of smoke. Now there's your army marching in. The sun will be turned to darkness. And the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Well, now, is that talking about something that's literally going to happen, the moon turning into blood and the sun turning dark? No. It's symbolic language. The sun is darkened. When? Well, it's darkened during an eclipse, during a solar eclipse. And when the sun is eclipsed, then time is run out. The governors are cast down. And the moon turns bright red in a lunar eclipse. I don't know if you've ever been out to see a lunar eclipse, but the, the sun turns excuse me, the moon turns blood red during a lunar eclipse. And of course, the language of turning into blood also calls together the idea, calls up the idea of a curse. <coughs> excuse me, because shed blood, blood poured out, is a curse. But beyond that, the uh, turning into blood is almost certainly a reference to a lunar eclipse. The sun and the moon are eclipsed. The rulers and authorities are cast down. Now, Peter says that this happened at Pentecost. So you see, it's not something that's going to happen later on in history that hasn't happened yet. It's already happened. But it didn't happen in some literal sense. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Okay? And at the beginning of his quotation, he says this this gift of tongues is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. So it's a sign that Israel is going to be judged, that the Spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh, and that there will be a judgment against those who don't repent. And their suns and their moons will be judged. Now the same kind of language is found in the book of Revelation. If we look at Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 17, we read similar language about these heavenly, glorious bodies. And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became blood, and the like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. Okay, is this talking about the end of the world? Uh, something that we should expect actually to happen in literal terms? Well, not in the book of Revelation because just a chapter or two later in chapter 8, the sun, moon, and stars are still there. In chapter 6, he broke the sixth seal. Chapter 8, we read he broke the seventh seal. In verse 1, and then uh, in terms of the seventh seal, we have these um, trumpets that show up. And what in the world, what do you know? In verse 10, the third angel sounded his trumpet, and the great star fell from heaven. A star fell out of heaven. Well, if they'd all already fallen, where is this one coming from? In verse 12, the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were smitten, so that the third of them might be darkened. All right, so the heavenly bodies are still there, uh, and there's more symbolic judgments against them in chapter 8. Here in chapter 6, let's look at it. Okay, in verse 12, the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. Here again be a reference to an eclipse. The re an eclipse of important social and political individuals, uh, the great men of the times. Probably here a reference to uh, shaking down of powers just before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. That's my understanding of the text, and there is material referenced in your bibliography that uh, would substantiate that. At any rate, there is no particular reason to take this literally, since we have established its symbolic usage throughout the scripture. The moon became like blood, a lunar eclipse, you see and the stars of the sky fell to the earth. Well, that can't literally happen. Stars are way too vast to fall to the earth, but figuratively, they can. The heavenly, those who are positioned in the heavens are cast down. 
uh, probably not a reference to angels here, but to various important people in the nation. So, there's that symbolism. And finally, in Matthew chapter 24, no discussion of this symbolism would be complete without that. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, after the destruction of Jerusalem, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. What's this referring to? Well, I believe it's referring to the shaking of the Gentile powers. The, uh, after, after God destroys the apostate uh, rebellious Jews at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, then the scripture says that the gospel goes out uh, with even greater power to the nations of the world. And they begin to be shaken down. And so, as Hebrews chapter 12 says, God will shake until only that which cannot be shaken remains. And here this shaking is. And uh, the suns, moons, and stars of all the nations of the world will be shaken down and replaced by God's people, the Son of Righteousness and His heavenly host. That seems to be the thought. And so when we look at the sky, let's remember these things. If we have an opportunity to see a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse, don't pass it by. It's fascinating to watch these things and see them through Bible eyes. Well, let me close with just a few speculations about uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Questions that get asked. What about the constellations? The Bible refers to constellations in the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 9. God makes the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, or Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Uh, does that mean that uh, God himself designed the shapes of these constellations, some of which perhaps we still have today? Well, I think it's entirely possible. Uh, there is a tradition in Christian thought going back to the early church that maintains this. Numerous evangelical scholars have written on it. But not much is done. That's understandable because astrology has perverted the constellations and used them as a prophet, prophetic fortune-telling device. Nonetheless, uh, it's entirely possible that they were designed by God and we should learn to appreciate them. If we look over at Job chapter 38, verses 31 to 33, God says to Job, Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Now, the Pleiades are the seven stars that are grouped together, seven sisters, and the idea is that they are chained together. Can you loose that? Can you change it? Or the cords of Orion, the design that holds those stars together in the sky. They're not literally close together from what we can tell, but they are to the eye. Can you lead forth Maseroth, uh, translated constellation in its season, guide the bear with her sons, great bear and the lesser bear and the other little constellations up there. And then what's interesting is verse 33. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? Now if we look back at Revelation, uh, Genesis chapter 1, then uh, remember that the sun, moon, and stars were made as signs or symbols, and they were also made as governors. And this seems to tie that symbolic function to the constellations. That uh, part of what they symbolized anyway, in addition to being armies of men, heavenly hosts, and important people and rulers, uh, part of their symbolism is the organization of them into the constellations, the circumpolar constellations of the bear and uh, her satellites and the uh, constellations of the equinox. Now the Bible strictly forbids the worship of these things or use of them for fortune telling. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19, Deuteronomy 17 verses 3 to 7, uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 2, and so forth. But that doesn't mean that God didn't design them. God made the sun. When men worshiped the sun, they were punished for it. But the sun itself is good and symbolizes the Lord, as we've seen. 
And so it's possible that these constellations were designed by God, and it's simply a perversion of them that our books always associate them with Greek heroes, and uh, so little is known about them. There's a lot of research that might be done here, and there is some information in the bibliography on it. Now, if the constellations are biblical, that is, if it's possible uh, to have a biblical view of constellations, biblical astrology, study of the stars and their symbolic meaning, then what do they represent? Uh, there are two schools of thought. Uh, one is that the, uh, the course of the constellations of the equinox were designed to symbolize the history of the world uh, in a type or the history of the New Covenant, or the end of the world. And so if you go from one to the other, you have stages of history. Uh, the other viewpoint, which I think has more to commend it, is that the twelve constellations are associated with the twelve tribes of Israel. And uh, that's a more traditional view, and it has, I think, more to commend it. Now, we can't be dogmatic about these things, but it's something that we might be alert to and might find very interesting. That's one speculation we might discuss. We have discussed about as much as I'm going to. The constellations. Uh, a second idea having to do with the stars and the sun and the moon that's been put forth in recent years is a thesis by a Frenchman named Barnouin, and the bibliography mentions him, his essay, a rather complicated essay. Mr. Barnouin suggests that the numbers, the census numbers that we find in, in the book of numbers, uh, this tribe has so many people, that tribe has so many people, that these numbers actually in the providence of God correspond to astronomical cycles. And uh, that the idea in the book of numbers is that you have the twelve tribes grouped around the tabernacle in a way similar to the way the planets and moons are grouped around the sun and that these numbers, there are just too many coincidences for us to dismiss his thesis. That, uh, and it works out. Well, I think there's a lot to that. Other scholars have thought so too. Uh, commentar commentaries on numbers now generally refer to this as one very interesting sidelight on the census figures there. And if you are able to read mathematics and would like to pursue it, uh, you can order a copy of this from the bibliography. So possibly that's another slant on the symbolic dimension of the sun, moon, and stars of the planets as they go around the sun. The number of days it takes for a planet to return to the same place in the sky, which is called a synodical period, that uh, those numbers of days are used uh, symbolically or in the providence of God. The, the number of people that came out of Egypt correspond to those numbers of days and that this shows that Israel is God's new heavens grouped around the sun. Well, possibly. It's an interesting thought and one that would be deserving of a lot of research. Third, what about the Star of Bethlehem? What about the Star of Bethlehem? Well, there are a lot of speculations about that as well. The fact is, however, that the Star of Bethlehem actually hovered over a house. Uh, it moved along apparently not just apparent motion, but actually settled over a particular domicile so that uh, the uh, wise men could locate it. Now well, that's not possible for anything that's positioned way up in the sky. There is a star, however, that can do that, and that is the glory cloud of God or a particular angel shining. Since angels are associated with stars, possibly the star of Bethlehem was one of the angels, perhaps Gabriel. Uh, or perhaps it was the glory cloud itself appearing as simply a small but bright star. There is some interesting discussion of other possibilities in Ernest Martin's book, The Birth of Christ Recalculated. You have that in your bibliography. Uh, finally, the question comes, will we settle in outer space? Children like to ask that question, and my answer is, why not? Uh, God has given us the world and there's no reason to think that there's any boundary to prevent us from exploring and harvesting the riches and appreciating the beauties of outer space. 
It may not happen in our lifetimes, and if, but it may happen in centuries to come. It all depends on your eschatology. If you believe the Lord is coming soon, then you wouldn't expect that to happen. If, like me, you expect there to be a long, possibly a long period of kingdom prosperity before the Lord returns, then it's entirely possible that uh, space will be explored and even colonized and settled. No reason particularly not to think so. I don't believe there are any aliens in outer space uh, because that raises too many problems. I mean, there might be angels, but if there are aliens, then what in the world are they? Did they fall in Adam? Did Christ die for them? If they're not related to Adam, then what does Christ's death have to do with them? If they didn't fall, then they're just basically angels. If they did fall, does Christ have to come again and again and again? Uh, that's impossible. Bible. So, I don't expect to find any intelligent life in outer space. Uh, God made humanity and the angels. He placed humanity on the earth and the angels in his heaven. Uh, angels may have free access to outer space and travel around it. For all I know, they do. But uh, as human beings mature, we may very well move out there as well. And there's no reason not to think we will. Well, this has been a discussion of the glory of the sky, the sun, moon, and the stars, these things that God made. And uh, whether we go into space very far or not, when we look at the heavens, I hope that we'll be able to see them not just as mere lights in the sky or stars as they're discussed on public television, but also as the canopy that God has placed around this earth, a canopy of beauty and of glory, and a realm that symbolizes his heavens and the promise that we too will be stars around his throne. Well, this is the end of the second lecture in the series, Rocks and Stars and Dinosaurs.